greatly appreciate it. VBS is coming up the 10th and 13th of June. Wednesday night, we have our Bible study with the adults. On, we're continuing the book of Revelation. We've got the lay to see in church this week. So that's going to be a fun one. So uh, that's Wednesday night. And then, of course, our classes for our kids and our youth and our young adults on Wednesday night. I encourage you to come be a part of that. <clears throat> As Beth told you this morning, the peanut butter egg sale, uh, they're selling these peanut butter eggs. If you can help with that, this helps to uh, fund the VBS. It's all what they use these funds, these monies from these egg sales to help with VBS. So if anything you can help, there's a sign-up sheet on the welcome desk. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe that there's three different dates that they'll deliver them to you. So if you can help with that, that will be uh, greatly appreciated. Also collecting candy for the month of March for the uh, family day that's coming up on the 31st of March. I encourage you to uh, make plans for that if you can help with the candy. Uh, if, 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 you, if you don't shop for candy, if you want to just slip Beth uh, uh, 5 or $10 or something like that, she can go get the candy herself with the little prizes. I know that would help too. So uh, the Russell family just walked in. They'll be sneaking in here in just a minute. All right. There's the nursery ministry schedule. That means we can go to prayer. And uh, we got quite a few things that we're continuing to pray about. Steve has been moved to a uh, facility uh, right near, will be moved to a facility right there near the hospital to try to help him out. So please remember, uh, Steve, that God will touch and minister him. Ronnie has his appointment on Friday uh, to uh, discuss uh, what's going on with him. Of course, continue to remember Amy. She's recovering from her surgery. Mike McFarlane, Trudy Perkins, Frank Hole, all these are dealing with cancer. Jeff Caldwell, continue to pray for them. Uh, continue to pray for Steven as he's recovering from his surgery. And uh, also Derek Livingston dealing with cancer. Uh, Brother Jenkins is dealing with cancer. And little Lily's dealing with cancer. Uh, a lot of cancer going around right now. So uh, we want to continue to remember them. Continue to remember Tabitha. She's battling with these uh, pains that are coming and going in her head. Uh, she had this once before, and they were saying that she was having little TAs, little mini strokes that were causing these pains. But uh, she's dealing with these things again. So remember her, if you will. And God will touch her. Continue to remember Annie Fisher, who's dealing with some issues with pregnancy. Uh, Teresa Ball is asking us to remember her family. And uh, Whitney is dealing with some sciatica uh, trouble. So remember Whitney, if you will. A little Serenity's doing some better, but uh, still needs a touch from the Lord. Uh, pray for Jerry Lynn. Pray for that whole situation. Uh, I know she would want you to do that. So remember that situation. God will touch her and minister here. Uh, I, I went in my office just a little bit ago, so she opened my desk. And right on top on, on the drawer I had open, there was a post-it note that Jerry Lynn had wrote me. She said, I love you, Pastor. Thanks for everything. So... Uh, uh, that was one of, them, one of them back in the day deals. It just reminds you that, that God still got her. So remember that situation. Remember Jake Rhodes? This is a, a friend of uh, uh, Brother David John Rhodes. His, his son was in an accident this past week, had to have surgery on his leg. He is recovering and recovering well, so remember him, if you will. Uh, also continue to remember the Rice family. Uh, they, they've not heard anything that I know of yet from William. Um, last they told, he went to work and told him he was taking some vacation. And uh, told Della he was getting away for a few days, and they still haven't heard from him. And uh, they even ha have, have not even heard anything from him from work. Uh, so uh, remember, remember, remember this fa family in this situation. Uh, also, Fred Sane, who has an aortic valve replacement uh, scheduled. Uh, also want to thank you for praying for my dad. Uh, he uh, got to go home on Friday uh, from the hospital. Uh, they do have this new medicine in him. I talked to him today. He's, he's, he's not feeling well today, uh, but he said he's going to try to make it to church tonight. Uh, you know, if you spend a whole week in the hospital, it probably take you a couple of days to recover from it just because you don't get no sleep when you're in the hospital. So uh, if you would, just thank you for praying for my dad. Continue to pray for my dad that God would touch him and minister to him. Uh, continue to remember Jerry, uh, this uh, tumor that they found in his kidney. Um, we, we're praying for a miracle for that, that God would touch him and heal him and make him whole. So uh, I want to thank the Lord for that. I want to give you a praise report on behalf of the Crisis Apprentice Center. Paula. Uh, sent me a picture today. As I told you, she was at the uh, uh, Living Word Church today to receive their check for their baby bottle blessings. Uh, they they had put it out on Facebook what they were doing, and a lady from Illinois had sent a check to the church for a thousand dollars for towards that. Uh, another uh, church out of Matthews called them and said, "Listen, uh, if you if you run, whatever you run short, go ahead and make up the difference, and we're going to send you a check for the difference." And uh, they uh, she received a check today for ten thousand dollars. She was on. If she was on time, I'd let her tell it. But since she's late, I'm gonna steal the thunder. All right. <laughs> but uh, uh, I thank God for that. 
Uh, we're going we're gonna to put that money to good use, saving babies, helping mamas. And we got a new machine that we're uh, working through. It's got Doppler on it. Uh, basically, that's able to scope out the baby and do the things that needs to be done for measurements and all those kind of things. So just a, a great new machine that we've got, plenty of volunteers. Do have a prayer request as it relates to the Crisis Pregnancy Center. Our, uh, our um, uh, medical doctor that we have on, that, that is overseeing our medical program, uh, he was in uh, private practice. He's now going under the umbrella of the of the hospital. He's already told the hospital that he he what he's doing with us currently, and they said it shouldn't be a problem. But uh, with him going under their umbrella, their insurance, that kind of thing, it could be a problem. So we're just praying God to work that out. It's a couple months out. So if you would remember that situation, that God would just uh, have His way, and uh, we're just believing for the Lord to uh, to move in that. But God, listen, God is. Uh, Paula and I were talking about this the other day, and she just walked in. So, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just, Paul, I've already told him, so you shouldn't have been late. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, she and I were talking about this the other day, and a lot of people, and it even kind of come up at lunch today, and I didn't really say anything about it, but it kind of come up at lunch today about, you know, why the churches, why, why does the same ministries like CPC and some of the other ministries, why does it seem like they succeed and get blessed, and it seems like churches struggle? Well, people are always, people are always willing to give to a cause, you know, uh, it, it's amazing to me, the churches that come together, uh, we, we may not agree theologically on a lot of different things, but we agree on life, and we agree on babies, and we agree on family. And so that's the ministry of CPC. And so you got Catholics and Methodists and Episcopalians and Lutherans and Methodists and Church of God and Pentecostal Holiness and all these different backgrounds and all these different genres, if you will, of, of worship and worship styles, but we all come together for the purpose of, 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 of life. And so uh, that's always, that's, it's always a blessed thing. As a matter of fact, the scripture even asks, is there not a cause? And so we, we understand that there's causes. The, the, the sad part is, is that uh, a lot of people don't see church as a cause and, uh, or as an as a operation, as a, a leg of the arm of the kingdom of God. And um, I, I read a study uh, just the other day, and it said in this area, and it was done particularly for the hickory Lincolnton area, in this area there's over 160,000 people that are in Catawba County, Lincoln County. Uh, and of those people, the median a- income is about $62,000 a year. That's the median income of the, of the hickory Lincolnton area. Of those people, that cl- 85% of them claim to be faithful to some organization, some religious organization in some manner or another. But of those people that, that claim to be faithful to some different organization, only 31% of them gave a minimum of $500 for that year to their church. 31 percent that's in lincoln and hickory that's not talking about some far out way somewhere there but in lincoln and hickory and and listen you got a median income of sixty two thousand dollars and on and and of that 31 percent they went down as far as less than one percent of giving as it relates to your income and of that only 31 percent of the people give to the church so that kind of lets you know where the mindset is when it comes to to the things of the kingdom and things of god and giving to the things of god and i'm not I'm not going to harp on that tonight, but I, I just I just want to let you know that that's where the mindset of people is. It, it makes it very difficult when when you're when you're wanting to do kingdom work and you want to do work for the kingdom. It, that people are more uh, prone to give to a cause than they are to, to give faithfully. Uh, and and to me, it's tithes and offerings. You know what I what I give to CPC, what I give above and beyond my tithe here at church. That's an offering. That's all part of it. It's part of doing what God. Uh, has, has blessed me to do. And, and I'm telling you, there's a blessing when you give. You can't outgive God. Amen? I feel like I'm about to take up an offering. Uh, you can't outgive God, I'm telling you. And so I would encourage you, you find something that God is blessing and put your, put your treasure there. Put your heart there. Uh, CPC is a great organization to give to. Uh, I wish I could write a $10,000 check tonight to say, go ahead and just put all that together and let's just go ahead and call ourselves debt-free and be done with it. But, but, you know, uh, we, we got the ability, opportunity that we can do more and more for the kingdom. And I encourage you, man, when God's blessing a ministry, and, and Tracy and I have been a part of this almost since the beginning. Tracy has definitely been a part of it since the beginning. But just to see uh, what God's doing, how God's brought us, where God's brought us from that little one-room office over behind Pizza Hut to now got a medical facility with medical equipment and doctors and nurses and all this stuff that are working together to, to save lives. Man, it's absolutely amazing volunteers and people that come in and all the things that are done absolutely amazing what god does so th- there is a cause there's a cause for life there's a cause to fight the the the, the just the the fight from hell of abortion 
Uh, thank God that there's a lot of victories that are being won in that area. Uh, thank God that there's a lot of uh, politicians that are standing up now beginning to put forth um, uh, different laws and, and different things that they're trying to do to, to stop it. Uh, as far as they're, they're now, there's a law now that they're working on. I think it's in South Carolina that they're working on that, that, that it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a, about the element of pain. It, it, if it's a, after 20 weeks, they don't want to do it. So uh, they're, trying to, they're trying to get it where it makes sense. Uh, it's not just about saving babies. It's about helping moms. You know, there's moms in this community that have gone through an abortion. Uh, so we try to help minister them, help them to realize, uh, yeah, you, you, you made a bad choice, but, hey, we, we want you to find healing from that. We want you to find restoration from that, that you can move on. So it's an all-around ministry that I love and I appreciate. And thank God for Living Word Church, and I thank God for the blessing of what they did today. And if you didn't hear, I'll say it again. Uh, she collected a check today for an amount of $10,000. Ashley got a text after she left saying, hey, the, the offering keeps growing. So there's more that's coming in from that. So uh, we thank the Lord for that. Would you give God a hand clap of praise? If you feel inclined to give towards CPC, Paul can tell you all day long how to do that. All right? So uh, you, you see her. We're going to have her We're gonna have her for one service here to, to tell you more about it because I know I talk a lot about it, but she can go a lot more in depth than I can. And we'll, we'll, we'll schedule that sometime in the near future and let her talk to you more about that but this is all matters of prayer and there's a lot of i thank god for what uh our team did this morning at the at the uh, christian ministries serving those that were there uh there's there's ministries within this community that are doing a lot of good and uh we we want to continue to lift them up and pray for them that god will continue to use them in a mighty way amen amen god's good if you would let's stand sandra's coming home thursday praise god all right god's good stand together let's pray and then uh, i'm gonna share a song Christian, can you come just for me a little light something? It, it helps me. It puts me in the mood. <laughs> uh, but uh, we're going to pray and just ask God to have his way and ask God to move minister these needs to request. And uh, we're just going to trust that God's going to speak to us tonight. I appreciate you all being here today. We're just looking forward to a great time in the Lord. And uh, thank you all for being here. But let's pray together. Father, we love you so much. Thank you for the opportunity once again that you've given us to come into your house. The opportunity, God, to call upon your name. You've been so good to us. We cannot thank you enough for the great things that you've done. Father, I ask you right now in the name of Jesus that you begin to move and minister to every need and request. Every, every, every heart of every person, God, that's on our list, those, God, that are in deep need, I pray, God, that you would minister to them and grant them that which they have need of. You said you know what we have need of even before we ask you. And so, Father, I ask you to touch them and minister to them, bring healing and deliverance to their bodies and their minds their souls. Help them experience your presence, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray that you would touch these that are here tonight. God, that you would speak into their lives and their hearts. I don't believe it's by chance or coincidence that we've walked into this door together tonight. I just pray, God, that you would speak to us, God. Help us, Lamb of God, to be drawn closer to you, to accomplish those things that you'd have us to accomplish, God, to be, to be effective in the areas you've called us to be effective in, God. We thank you for the blessing of what you've done for CPC. Thank you for the blessing of what you're doing here at Daystar, God, how you're moving and ministering and meeting the needs of people. God, I bless your holy name for that. God, I pray in the name of Jesus, God, that you would help us tonight. Help us, God, to hear your word, to receive it with gladness, that it would change our lives. God, we just surrender all that we are to you. Help us to draw closer to you. God, to seek after you, to be pure in heart, God, that we might see you, I pray, in the name of Jesus. God, I love you so much. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for all the great things that you do. You are so worthy of all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. And we ask all that we ask tonight in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. We had some folks walk in late. Take a minute, shake a hand, hug a neck. Welcome someone to the house of the Lord. We got some visitors. Let them know we appreciate them being here. That means move. Turn around. Talk to a couple people. Hug a neck. Do something.
You can be seated after you're done shaking hands and hugging necks. Praise the Lord. Tonight I will be ministering on a topic as it relates to the presence of God and what His presence demands. It's not a very popular topic uh, to talk about being holy, being pure. It's not, it's not what most modern day teachings are about. But I still believe in the truth of God's Word. I still believe that God's Word demands holiness. I still believe that God's Word demands purity, that we would be separated for the cause of Christ. And uh, I, I, I just, I, I'm hungry for it. There's, there's some things that I know God would love to do, that God would desire to do. There's, some, there's, a, there's a, a desire inside of me to see God. The Scripture says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That's my heart. I want to be pure before Him that I can see Him. But there's a hunger, there's a desire inside of me to live my life holy and separated for the cause of Christ. Worship with my sing tonight, Hunger for Holiness. a silent war that's raging deep within me my lower nature fights to dominate my spirit man is poised and locked in battle with the carnal side of me I've grown to hate verse 2 the trumpet of my prayers Place toward heaven A voice of desperation In my cry Lord, strengthen me That I might not Yield myself to sin Keep your righteous banner Lifted high Lord, I And I thirst for the righteousness that's yours. That my mind would be cleansed and my spirit renewed. And this The tempter stalks about me as a lion, searching for the slightest scent of blood. For when the skin of my resistance is broken, he moves in swiftly to deepen the cut. Oh Lord of creation, Hear your servant, you understand the weaknesses of man. I'm counting myself crucified with Jesus, alive to Christ, dead indeed to sin. Oh Lord, I hunger. thirst for the righteousness that's yours, that my mind would be clean, 
Let my spirit renewed And this temple that you dwell in This temple that you dwell in Lord, I hunger text, but if you'll turn with me to Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Thank you all for being here tonight. I appreciate you coming out and worshiping God with us. Matthew 5, verse 8, the Bible said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I want to talk to you tonight about a simple subject, pursuing his presence, pursuing his presence. Father, Help me tonight as I minister your word. Help me to accomplish what you've sent me to accomplish, to do and say only what you'd have me to do and say, God. I surrender all that I am to you. I pray, God, that you would have your way. I bless your name tonight, God. Open the ears of the hearers. Help them to hear your word and to receive it with gladness. Help us, God, to leave this place with a desire to be changed. Not changed just for the sake of change, but changed, God, because your presence has come into our midst. It's challenged our hearts to grow deeper and go further in you. I praise you, God, for what you're doing. I thank you, Father, for what you're doing in the hearts and lives of each and every person that's here tonight. Father, we surrender all that we are and all that we desire to be. We pray that you have your way. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. There's some quotes that I'll be giving you tonight, and they come from a couple of books that uh, I, I've had the pleasure of reading and going through. One is by Dr. Russell Morris, who is a pastor in the Church of God here in Western North Carolina. He wrote a book entitled Christian Ethics. One man that y'all are very familiar with, another book that I've got the pleasure of having in my library, is a book that Dr. George Voice wrote called My Declaration of Faith. What Dr. Voice talks about in this book, he takes our 14 points of our Declaration of Faith within the Church of God, and he expounds on them. And I'm not going to go through them most, uh, 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 mostly, but I want, you to, I want you to understand that there are some particulars that God is calling us to. There's some things that God is calling us to. And I, I, I don't want to get into denominational preaching. I just want to get into the Word and let you understand that the Word requires these things of us. Charles W. Kahn, who, who quoted Dr. Voice, or Dr. Voice rather quoted, said one of the most distinctive beliefs of the church is this, is that we believe holiness to be God's standard for living for his people. He also says this, this fact is asserted again and again in the Holy Scriptures and does not admit to objection or disagreement. Holiness is not left to the option of the believer. It is an absolute requirement for those who call themselves Christians. Jesus said, be ye holy, for I am holy. It is a requirement that God has called us to. Dr. Russell Morris wrote in his book, under the catching the call to holy living, he said this, the presence of willful, intentional, and unforgiven sin in the body of Christ is a serious matter. Scripture validates this statement by calling the believer to a holiness of life. God wants us to understand that if we're going to see his power move, if we're going to see his glory revealed in the church, we have got to separate ourselves from the things of the world. We've got to live our lives in a way that is holy and separated for the cause of Christ. Under the same heading of purity, Dr. 
Moore says this, the Christian life is a call to purity, holiness, sanctification, righteousness. Each of these terms emphasizes the importance of purity in one's life. This area of Christian living is often the source of legalism, fanaticism, and harshness on the part of some. For this reason, many decline to address the subject matter. Consequently, there's often no clear understanding of its importance. Dr. Raymond Culpepper was interviewing Brother Billy Wilson, who is now the president of Oral Roberts University. And Brother Culpepper said, I understand that the center, that the place that he was involved in before, is now involved in a process which is discussing the future of the Pentecostal charismatic movement. And then he said, what are you witnessing any major trends within the movement of the Pentecostal charismatics? And this is what Brother Wilson said. He said, we are definitely seeing some significant things that are very much alike around the world. This generation, this generation of young people and young adults now is very hungry for spiritual fathers and mothers. They want someone to stand by them, to empower them, to encourage them, and show them an example of personal integrity. It's a fresh cry for holiness, authenticity, integrity, and purity. What this generation needs to see from us are people that we live what we say we live, that we live and abide in the Word of God, that we're authentic in the way that we present ourselves, that we're not saying one thing in the church and living another way in the in the house, but we're living our lives totally separated for the call of God. So this, with this in mind, tonight I want to talk about pursuing His presence, but as an undertone to understand that His presence demands purity. What do you think of when you hear the word purity? Do, do, are there visions of innocence or beauty or, wet, or, or, or whiteness or holiness? Or, or maybe you feel, visualize the innocence of a newborn child, the beauty of the garden of God, the, the whiteness of the valley lily. So what is purity? The American Heritage Dictionary defines it this way. Purity is freedom from sin or guilt. It means innocence or chastity. There's no thing that is more unpopular but the truth, no truth that is more imperative for our times than Christian purity. God's people have got to separate themselves if they really want to see a move of God. It's not going to be drummed up in our music program. It's not going to be drummed up in our other programs. It's going to be found when God's people humble themselves under God's hand and separate themselves for the cause of God. He said, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, he said, I'll heal your land. I'll forgive your sin and I'll do the work of your life like you've never seen before I'm telling you friend it comes when we separate ourselves for the cause of Christ this theme could have been the battle cry of every holy band of saints throughout human, human history. And I think it falls or calls us into these final hours of the last great struggle to preserve our heritage of holiness while we're entering these last stages in this last day that we're living in of, 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 the, of denigrating morality, the struggles of people trying to find purity, even in, it staggers in, in, in this last long mile to complete disintegration, death, and doom. This is where we're seeing the world headed to. It seems that the church has been shorn of her power to condemn and, and, and robbed of her strength to salt the earth and light the world. God is calling us to a place that we begin to walk in holiness, that we begin to walk in a way that brings glory and honor to Him, that once again He can instill His power, that He can work through the church and and be what the church has caused to be. This is what we need to understand. That there is only one power on earth that can save the world. And that power is committed to the church by her founder, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So God is calling us to a place of purity. He's never intended that the church be pale or anemic. He's never called us to be without strength. The church is, is not an ark into which a favored few may enter in and float over a, 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 sea of golden, a, a, a sea of golden shores. The church is not an insurance agency to which men may, may pay their weekly premium and be insured against punishment and pain of eternal flames. Regardless of how it may appear, the church is not a social club where members assemble for fellowship and entertainment. The church is not a convalescent home where the spiritually crippled and morally weak are treated for the hereditary ills. The church was destined to be a a band of fiery soul, blood washed, battle scarred warriors that are sent on a mission, summoned to a conquest, and guided to a glorious destiny. This is what the church was called to be, but we were called to be pure and holy before God Almighty. Napoleon Bonaparte said this one time He said, Conquest made me what I am, and conquest will sustain me. What he meant by that is, listen, I went after some things and I became victorious over them. And those conquests are what keeps me going. 
Listen, friend, anytime we have a great victory in faith, it, 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 it catapults us to continue to do greater things. Anytime we overcome a, 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 an attack of hell and we come out on the other side with a shout, I don't know about you, but it, it helps me to say, you know what, I, I'm ready for the next one. You know what I'm talking about? When, when, when you, you struggled and you prayed and all of a sudden you see God come through and you see God move and God manifest His presence and His glory in a powerful way. There's something about that that says, listen, you can make it. You can keep on going. God is going to be favorable of your life and help you through. The spirit of conquest is the spirit of progress. The spirit of conquest is the spirit of survival. We're living in a time when we're called to seem like what feels like just to survive. The church is doing everything it can to struggle to hear that trumpet sound. We're doing everything we can to hold it together. We're doing everything we can to keep people on board. All while the draw of the world and the immorality and the draw and the pleasures of sin are sucking people away right out of the house of God to the point that they're surrendering and relenting themselves to ways of the world and thereby without any repentance or damning their soul to hell. God help us with that. See, this is what we need to understand is that our heritage that was actually purchased at Calvary and preserved for us through long years of human suffering is now being exchanged for fantasy and fanfare. It's not about our programs and how much we can impress you. It saddens me to tell you this, but there are houses of God that are now becoming entertainment centers. Let me impress you with my ability. Let me show you what I'm able to do. Let me show you how I'm able to impress you with my talent and my ability. Let me show you. Listen, friend, I know church folks that have got people in their leadership positions, and because they've got good talent, they don't even concern themselves with the way they live outside the world. Church pastor friend of mine, I had to sit down and talk with him because my daughter happened to pass one of the leaders of his music department in the grocery store carrying a 24-pack of beer. And I had to sit down and say, look, man, you and I need to figure this out because that's not sending the right sign. Of course, he didn't know it. But God has a way of causing sin to be found out. Amen. See, you got to understand, man, we can't sit idly back. We can't sit back and say, you know what, well, it'll work itself out. No. You give the devil an inch, he'll become your ruler. You allow the enemy to get in his toehold in the ministry. You get a toehold in the church. And before you know it, you're not experiencing power. You're not experiencing presence. All you're experiencing is just a, a, just a motivational speech. and a, Just experience some entertainment to satisfy yourself, to make you believe that you went to church. Listen, friend, I'm not settling for some kind of entertainment. I'm not settling for some motivational speech. I want a move of God, not for just me, but for my children and my loved ones. They need an outpouring of God's presence. And God's power. We can't settle for this. God help me tonight. It's not about fantasy. It's not about fanfare. The clear and easy to understand voices of those old time holiness preachers that used to preach holiness of hell. Oh God. See, they're now being replaced by soft voiced effeminate babblers. who make a play on words and latest trends and they leave their congregations in utter confusion. See, we better wake up. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 34, He said, think not that I've come to send peace on the earth. He said, I did not come to bring peace but a sword. Listen, understand that God requires this thing of us. That God is looking for this thing for us. This world of evil is an avowed enemy of the church. The battle lines are clearly drawn. There can never be any peaceful coexistence. Agreement is impossible when it comes to the church and the world. It's a conflict to the finish. It's a fight to the death. This old world is a battleground. It's not a playground. It's a battleground. This old ship of Zion is a battleship. It's not the love boat. Come on now. It's a battle, man. We fight. We endure. It can never be Christ and. It's always Christ or. You can't put Christ in it. You can't bring him in and affiliate him with any. It's Christ and. It's never, it's never Christ and. It's Christ or. It's either Christ or Egypt. It's either Christ or Belial. It's either Christ or Caesar. It's either Christ or the Antichrist. Or it's Christ or the world. He offers crosses. 
not cushions. We want to be comfortable in church. He didn't call us to be comfortable. He said, I want you to take up your cross and follow me. Not sit on your cushion and wait for me. I know it's Sunday night. I know y'all can handle this tonight, okay? See, this is what you got to understand. This is where you got to come from and understand that God has called us to follow Him. He invited us to fight, not to frolic. He called us to a place of execution, not excursion. See, we, we, we have this consumer mentality in the church. And the consumer mentality is, is dead in our, our, our ability to see the miracles of God. Because what the consumer mentality says is, give me what I want. I'm putting in, give me back. That's a consumer mentality. You don't go to the grocery store just to hand the cashier $180 and walk out empty-handed. Sometimes it feels like it. Amen. I, I've been in there with my wife and walked out, and I could carry the bags in my two hands and spent 200 bucks. But I don't go in there just say, hey, excuse me, I want to add to your teal. No, no, no. No, if I go to Walmart, I'm expecting something in return with the exchange. Are you with me? The sad part is, is we treat church the same way we treat Walmart. Because we walk into the church and we're saying, okay, God, I'm giving. I need you to give back. Because if you don't give back, I'm going to quit giving. I praise you, God, as long as everything goes all right. I worship when the preacher says, lift my hands, God, as long as I feel good. If you let me start feeling sick, God, I'm not going to be able to, I'm not going to be able to praise you like you really want me to. God, if you start letting my finances get messed up, then God, I, I'm just going to be able to worship like I, like I'm supposed to, God. I might not even show up at church on Sunday, God, if it don't work out the way I want to, because if I'm putting in, I want to get back. That's a consumer mentality. But a disciple says, if you lead me through the valley, I'll follow. If it doesn't work out in my favor, I'm still going to follow. If the sickness hits my body, I'm still going to follow. If the doctor says it ain't going to work out, I'm still going to follow. If the banker doesn't sign off on the loan, I'm still going to follow. If somebody parks in my parking space, I'm still going to follow. If somebody's sitting in my chair, I'm still going to follow. If the colors don't match, I don't care. I'm still going to follow. God's looking for disciples, not consumers. People that say, God, no matter what, no matter where, no matter how, now I will follow you. God, I'm not looking for comfortable. I'm not looking to be at ease. I just want your power. Those early disciples, every day their lives were threatened, but they kept on pursuing. They were brought before kings and governors, and they said, we're not careful to answer you in these matters. We've got an answer for you, and his name is Jesus. When he stood before those leaders of the church and they said, how in the world can this be? They said it was because of Jesus whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. They were not ashamed to talk about Jesus. Listen, friend, I get bold so bent been out of shape when you got preachers that don't want to talk about Jesus. They don't want to talk about the blood. They don't want to talk about the cross. But let me tell you, that's where my victory's at. My victory's in the fact that Jesus hung on a cross and died for my sins and helps me to be holy in the sight of God. Got to talk about it. Got to talk about it. See, if the church is shorn of her purity, she's going to be robbed of her power. If you get away from being pure, you lose your power. See, there won't be no need for us to do like Samson. The Bible said that Samson had his eyes gouged out, had his hair cut, but he did not know that the Spirit of God had departed. And the Bible said that he would go out and shake himself like he did times before. But this time, he went too far. Won't be no need for the church to be like Samson. Because there'll be no need to go out and shake ourselves after the, after the enemy's overtaken us. When he comes in, it's going to be too late to shake. When Samson realized that his hair had been cut and his power had been left, they took him and made him a humiliation. Now, we know that's not the end of the story. 
That's why I'm here to report to you that it's not the end of the road for the church. And I'm not talking about Daystar Church. I'm talking about the church. I'm talking about blood, bald, blood washed people of God that are remnant of God. I got a phone call this afternoon from a minister here in the community. He said, listen, I want you to come and preach the word at my church on Palm Sunday, on that Sunday afternoon. I said, I'd be glad to. He said, listen, I'd invite some other people. They don't want to preach the word. They don't want to stand the word. Listen, friend, I believe that there are a bunch of people standing in pulpits and they ain't much more than a bunch of pansies because they're scared to tell people what the truth is. Listen, I'm not harsh about it. I'm not going to beat you up with it. But I'm telling you that truth, if you know that truth, that truth will make you free. I don't want to be too late to shake. Christ mentions the church. His first place that he mentions it is the proper perspective for all time in Matthew 16, 18, and 19. He said, upon this rock, I say to you, you're Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Listen, this is what he's saying to the church. He says, look, church, I'm giving you authority. There ain't a devil in hell that should be victorious over the church. There ain't a spirit of division or fear or confusion. Whatever the enemy tries to bind the church with, there's not a devil in hell that should be able to bind the church. I'm glad half of you convinced. If I can just get the other half convinced and get on the board and say, listen, Pastor, we're with you. We'll fight devils. We'll fight hell. We'll do whatever we've got to do. I'm telling you, we'll begin to see Lincoln County turned upside down for the glory of God. It's not about this group or that group. It's about people determining within themselves that they're going to be people that appear before God, living their lives holy and acceptable unto God and proving what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. He said, I will build my church. Jesus said, I will build my church. This is conquest. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It's conquest. It's militant aggression. It's contrast. We were never called to be in the world, uh, uh, of the world. We were never called to act like the world. We were never called to participate in the things of the world. We were called to be different, to come up from among them and be a separate. There's supposed to be contrast. Why? Because if there's no contrast, what are you trying to win them to? There's no separation if there's nothing different about you. What are you trying to win them to? There has to be contrast. It's the church against the world. It's purity against filth. It's holiness against sin. It's righteousness against corruption. It's the church against the gates of hell. So I take my stand with preachers as far back as Peter who preached thousands of texts but always arrived at the same conclusion. Live holy, separated, or it's hell. Can't allow sin to be a domain in your life. Can't allow sin to reign in your mortal body. I know you probably want me to dress it up and make it pretty, but there's no other way to say it. Sin will put you in hell, friend. You have to live separated for the cause of God. As far as the Bible is concerned, holiness is the only experience that is absolutely mandatory if you're going to see God. The Bible tells in Hebrews 12 and 14, Follow peace with all men and holiness without which No man shall see the Lord. Matthew 5 and 8 again, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. It is a mandatory requirement that we be pure and holy before God if we desire to see Him. See, these verses don't only mean that we will see God at the end of this life. They also indicate that a pure heart opens the eyes of a sanctified believer so that he can in this life behold the greatness of God and be a partaker of his divine nature. Listen, when you begin to see God in this life, it will absolutely change your walk. It will change your talk. It will change everything about you. When you've decreed in your life, God, I am abstaining from the appearances of evil. I'm cleaving to the things which are good. I'm telling you, power will begin to flow in your life and you can see a demonstration of the power of the Holy Ghost in your life. See, the Bible doesn't say you have to have the Holy Ghost to see God or you have to speak in tongues to see God or you have to be Pentecostal to see God or that you have to be a successful preacher to see God, that you have to keep up with the trend of the times to see God, that you have to keep in step with contemporary religious thought to see God. But the Bible says you must have a pure heart and be holy to see God. On the political scene, 
We're in one of the fastest transitions periods in every time in history. Some different days we're living in. The nation is fast becoming a welfare state, a socialist government. The days of our republic are numbered. I believe that. We saw it in ancient Rome, and the United States is headed on the same trend that Rome headed on. That usually, that eventually was its demise. But beyond all question, we're living in the most momentous period of history. I believe that this is the generation that very well could see the coming of the Lord. Amen. I believe it's very possible, folks. But I can assure you that the truth, even though all the political changes and the social changes and the worldly changes, there are some things that do not change. His word does not change. I don't care what that preacher said or this preacher said. God's word does not change. His word, he said forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Thy word is truth. There is truth in the word of God. You can stand on it. I'm telling you, no matter how high the waves get, no matter how hard the wind blows, God's word will sustain you and keep you. You can be dependent on the Word of God. There's a lot of folks today that are talking about Pentecostal power. It appears to me that many of them think that they can have the power regardless of the way that they live. But you don't buy it. It remains one of the unalterable facts of time and eternity. You cannot have power without purity. Listen, we were a holiness movement long before we were a Pentecostal movement. The founder of the Church of God, R.G. Sperling, he said, we're going we're gonna to live our lives more holy and we're going to see more of God. And they were called the Christian Union at the time. They were a, a distinct holiness movement. The people made up of Methodism, Methodism Wesleyans that pulled away and said, there's got to be more to this relationship. For 10 years, for 10 years, that holiness church sought the Lord before the Spirit even fell. Up at Shearer Schoolhouse where a hundred of them in one night received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But for 10 years, they sought God. Absolutely amazes me, the number 10. 10 days, they sought God prior to the day of Pentecost. And they had an outpouring. What was happening in that 10 days? What was happening in that 10 years of consecration and separation and pray, praying before God and asking God to get out the old and bring in some new? Listen, friend, that's why Peter was able to stand up and said, these men are not full of old wine. They're not drunk on wine like you suppose, but they're filled with new wine. Why? Because God sent a new outpouring. God sent a new power. God sent a new presence of his glory. Why? Because those men and women consecrated themselves before the presence of God. God changed them. Listen, we were a holiness movement. I believe that if it took holiness to receive the Holy Ghost, it's going to take holiness to retain the Holy Ghost. I don't care if you spoke in tongues 25 years ago, if you've lived like hell since then, don't think just because you utter in tongues today that you're impressing me or God. Come on now. <laughs> it took it. Purity is that quality of character that identifies you with Jesus Christ. He'll claim kindredship with you on no other grounds but that because he's holy, you're holy. That's what identifies you with God. That's what separates us. Purity is the only thing that can bring you to terms with God. To go forward without purity is to go forward without God. If you're going to be pure, if you want to go with God, you better go pure. In this age of suspicion and fear and panic and despair, men and women need peace of mind, courage and hope, guidance and direction. They need a deeper understanding of what God has. This can only be found when, my, when men find the experience of heart purity, which alone brings them in right relationship with God. You've got to be pure. To be socially accepted today, you've got to subscribe to the theory that all men are created free and equal. That, that, that every man has a right to everything that everyone else possesses. That's the way their thinking is today. Amen. Tim Hawkins has a song called The Government Can. If you've never heard it, it's pretty funny. You ought to go listen to it. Who can take your money and throw it all away? The government, the government can. <laughs> but that's what they do. They take your tax money and they're paying for abortions in other countries. That's the, that's the day and age that we're living in. 
But, but, but if you're going to live in this understanding of knowing what God has called us to, to be accepted, you've got you to gotta fall in line with these theories. And, and in this, even in this present religious world, the proper chin is to accept this new morality. But part of this new morality is that truth is relative. What that means is, if it fits my mode of living and how I want to live, then I'll accept it. But if it doesn't, then it doesn't apply to me. That's an easy way to explain principles of Scripture away. Well, it's not relative. It, 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 it doesn't relate to my situation, so I, I don't need it. Or it doesn't make me feel good about my situation, so I don't need it. So they have making truth, and they made it relative. But I believe in the immutability of truth. I believe that truth does not change. I believe that what God said to Moses in the desert way some 6,000 years ago, he still means the day while we stand here. What he spoke through Peter on the day of Pentecost, he still means while we're right here. What he wrote through the epistles, of, uh, that epistles that Paul wrote back in the, back in the uh, early ages of, uh, of, the, uh, of the 90s and uh, 100 AD, all those letters that he wrote, what he meant then, he means today. Paul, what God is, listen, there are truths like the principle of sin, the holiness of God, the demand for purity in man, they're not relative. They're required. The infallibility of scriptures. The truths of hell. Listen, I can preach heaven all day long and we'll shout about it. But if, I, if I'm going to balance my message, I've got to let you know that there's a hell. An endless eternity. The nature, the curse of sin is deadly. But the perfect cure for all of this is found in the provisions of Calvary. It's all found in Jesus. These are not relative. I know that some people try to explain away the death of Jesus. They tried to do it right after he resurrected. They tried to give the soldiers money and said, you go tell the story that the disciples told them. They've been trying to make it a relative story uh, or an irrelevant story for, for history. Listen, there's still people trying to make it an irrelevant story, but it is not irrelevant. I promise you it is just as true. It is just as mutable today that Jesus died, that he was buried, that he rose again on the third day, and that soon and very soon he's coming to call his children home. It, listen, you can call it what you want to call it. I call it truth, and I say that that truth is about to come to pass that God's about to call his children home and he's coming back for a bride that's without spot a bride that's without wrinkle a bride that's without blemish he's coming back for a pure and holy separated bride of Christ I still believe as the scripture tells us in the book of Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 4 that the soul he the soul who sins shall die the soul that sins shall die I still believe again, as Hebrews said, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. I believe that no man receives Pentecost without purity. Amen. I still believe that there's no true power without purity. There's a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. There's a looking good kind of religion, but it's not established in truth. <laughs> see, I believe that. I believe power without purity is power that destroys because if you're walking in power without purity, then you're not walking humbly. You're making it about you. There's been a many a ministry that have fallen because men and women begin to make it about themselves rather than making it about Jesus. All of a sudden, they found themselves sitting on the throne declaring, look what I've done. And it falls. They're declaring themselves to be God. Maybe not in word, but in action. It's lawlessness. It's anarchy. It's rebellion against restraint, and its ultimate end is slavery. The word purity, it means the state or quality of being clean, freedom from foreign or adulterating matter. It means innocence, virtue, absence of evil or improper motives. This is what it means to be pure. It not only includes one state of being, but it digs in the heart of conduct. It digs down to who you are. You know, there's a big difference in your reputation and in your integrity. Reputation is what people think you are. Your integrity is who you really are. You can come in this church and you can shout and speak in tongues and dance around. And you might impress people sitting around you, but God knows your heart. God knows if it's truth or if it's not. And you'll be held accountable for that. See, this is the place that we've got to come to. The one truth that underlies Pentecostal experience is the truth of holiness. That's our heritage. It's hard to keep up with all the fads and the trends. I'm telling you, friend, just as soon as you can catch up with one thing, they've created a different one. And I'm talking about in church. 
Just as soon as I get one catchphrase caught down, they've got them a different one caught up. Amen. I just said, forget it. Man. Let's just go back to the truth. Let's go back to the book. Tell them what the word says. That's the, that's the best catchphrases you could ever catch. You know, they, 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 they absolutely spiritualize things to make it sound so glorious. And all it is is empty. I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll say things, listen, and, I, and I'm not throwing off anybody, but I, they'll say things like, this is your time, this is your season, this is your year, this is your, and you're, listen, I thought, this is the year that God's going to show up, this is the year that God's going to demonstrate his power himself. Wait a minute, I thought God worked every year. You know, I know that there's times that he does things in a greater fashion here than he might have done at this time here. I understand that. I'm not throwing off on it, but, but when you all of a sudden, you just, you know, at the beginning of the year, I told you there were preachers to getting on the radio. This is the year of God's presence. This is the year of God's power. God's going to show up in a mighty way this year. I'm thinking, he showed up pretty good last year. I can't wait to see what he does this year. You know? They, 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 they try to use these spiritual catchphrases that get your attention. And then before you know it, they got you hooked. And they're saying, if you'll just send us $1,000, we'll be able to do more for the kingdom of God. <laughs> There's the hook. <laughs> Help me, Jesus. So you can't get caught up in the trends and the fads. Noah refused to follow the trend of his day. And the flood was over and the world was a watery waste. Noah rested on the top of Mount Ariat in the perfect will of God. He was right where God wanted him to be. He got through the flood, but right where he wanted to be. Moses refused, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And when Pharaoh and his armies lay dead on the shores of the Red Sea, my, Moses was climbing to that rugged mountain of Mount Sinai to have a face-to-face -face meeting with God. Why? Because he refused to follow the fads and trends of the world. Daniel would not defile himself with the king's meat. And when Belshazzar lay, dying, lay, lay there dying, Daniel was still reading the handwriting on the wall, telling of a day when the little stone that was cut out of, without hands would become a great mountain and fill the whole earth. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they refused to dance to the devil's music. And when they were standing in that fiery furnace, they listen, everybody was telling them, get with it, don't be squares. But those three Hebrew boys, they stood up right and looked the other way. And when they landed in that fiery furnace, amongst those burning blazes was found a fourth man who took the burn out of the fire. Can I tell you, friend, when you stand for God, when you be what God has called you to be and do the things that God would have you to do, the greatest danger signal this day is that men are so fascinated by change. And I realize that change is necessary to progress. But change in itself is not progress. Change can be destructive. Men have become reckless, <laughs> daring to scrap without hesitancy the precious legacies of the past. You can't let those things go. I, I'm not standing here on my own. I'm standing on the shoulders of great men and women of God that have gone before me and have paved the way. I'm not here and naive to tell you that I've made it on my own. I know that there have been men and women that have preached this word that have refused to give up on me and prayed for me and believed for me and supported me and even rebuked me and challenged me. And that's why I'm here. And I can't just throw that away, folks. Are you with me? <laughs> They're consigned to the ash heap, the time-tested principles and standards established by men of bygone years. It's accepted that church of God people don't have to be different now. We're still called to be different. We're still called to dress modest, and, 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 and there's places that are off limits to us. This, this new morality is taking its toll, folks. You've got to present yourself in a way that's glorifying God. You're separated for His purposes. If we're going to savage any of this stuff that God has laid down before us as foundations that were set up by those, we've got to assert ourselves, rediscover our mission, and validate our claims in the, in, in, in the world's darkest night and the time's last hour. There's a clear voice. That's being given to us to, the right direction is desperately needed today. We've got to understand where we're going. We've got to understand that God's calling us to a specific place. And, man, we've got to be consecrated before God. I can't afford to surrender now. My girls are dependent on me to get it right. Listen, this church is dependent on me to get it right. We as people of God, this community is dependent on us to get it right. There's hundreds of churches in this county. And some of them are just content with going through the motions. Somebody's got to be willing to cast the devil out. Somebody's got to be willing to have enough power that they can lay hands on the sick and they recover. Somebody's actually got to have a walk with God where they just don't talk the talk, but they actually live a life. And people say something's got to be different. Something's got to be changed. Listen, folks. The only way that's going to come is when we determine within ourselves that we're going to purify our lives and we're going to be what God's called us to be. 
This clear voice giving right direction is desperately needed today. Somebody within the church got to stand up and say, man, we got to do what's right. We're dying here, folks. We're not seeing and experiencing the move of God like we used to see. You've been coming here just a little while. You, you've seen anybody divinely healed? Divinely healed. Peggy, you've been in this thing a while. You've seen somebody divinely healed? It's been a while. I mean, you know what to be divinely healed even means? Not exactly. Because it's not an experience. Brother Major and I were talking about it the other day. Well, it's been a couple of weeks ago. He was saying to me, he said, Pastor, why, why do we don't see the healings that we used to see? I believe it goes back to the principles of the founding of the church. He said, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind, it be bound. Whatever you loose, it be loosed. I really believe is that we don't assert ourselves in the authority that we've been given by Christ. I was praying the other day, and it's so easy. I, I was telling God, I said, God, you know, in your word, there, there were places where they said that they looked upon the people and they saw that they had faith to be healed. There was something within that person that said, God's going to heal me. I think about blind Bartimaeus when the Bible says that they, they said the master's calling for you that he shook off his, his outer garment and he ran to where Jesus was. That outer garment represented who he was. He was a blind beggar. And he shook it off to go before Jesus. And you know the rest of the story. He received his sight. But I believe there was an anticipation in, in, Bart, in Bartimaeus that said, you know what, I, I'm about to go into the presence of God. I'm about to go into the presence of the one that's able to heal me. And he shed that which labeled him. That he could walk into the presence of God, new and fresh, and receive everything God had for him. I wonder how many times we walk in that door with the labels of our past, the labels of our weak, the labels of our failures. And we come and sit in God's presence just shrouding those labels. And we're saying, God, if if you could, if you could find it in your heart and possibly to forgive me and help me and heal me, God, I, I appreciate it if you if you would do that for me. Where, where, where's our determination to say, this is not what I am? This is, I'm about to walk into the presence of God. I'm about to walk into a promise of his presence because he said, we're two or three in my name. I'm, I'm, I'm in the midst. I'm here. I'm not saying this bragging, but I, 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 I preached and watched a woman pull the hearing aid out because as I preached, she was healed. I've I, I prayed for people with, that, that come to the altar and with a walker and took off running around the church. I remember in the mountains praying for a lady to come up to a walker. She had poor circulation from her waist down. She, she didn't have the strength or ability to even hardly walk. She was laboring to come up with her walker. We prayed for her. She took off a lap inside the church, went out the door and run around the outside of the church and come back in. You know, I, I, I can tell you what I've seen. I can tell you what I've experienced. Or I can say, listen, I know what it takes to get there. I know what it takes by the word for us to get back in that place. That we're not just an assembly of people, but we're actually the church. That the gates of hell shall not prevail against. And it starts with determining within ourselves, saying to God, God, I know I got to be consecrated. I know I got to be different. I know I got to abstain from the appearance of evil. I know I got to do these things. 2 Corinthians 7 and 1 says we got to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh got to cleanse ourselves further in Romans 12 and 1 that we be not conformed to this world be transformed by the rule of our mind that we may prove us that good acceptable and perfect will of God listen if you're going to be acceptable God you got to you got to refrain from the things of the world I put the wrong verse up there Tracy it's verse 2 actually but he said be not conformed to the world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you could prove was that good acceptable and perfect will of God Holiness is who we are. I'm not coming to you to try to preach doom to the church or 
damnation to the people of God. I, I, I'm just a watchman. I'm just a, I'm just a soldier of the cross. I'm just a disciple trying to say, listen, we, we got to understand where we are, but we also got to understand where we're going. I thank God for, for, for some of the things that are being done around the community. I thank God for some of the outreaches that are taking place. I thank God that there are churches that have food clauses and they're trying to make sure people got food and they're supporting Christian ministries. I thank God for all those things. But I'll tell you something. There are people that are filled with demons in this community. There are people that are sick beyond measure. And that sickness is not meant to be in death, but it's to be for the glory of God. And somebody within the community has got to rise up and say, I live separate, God. I live holy, Lord. I live my life like I need to to please you, God, so that I can walk with power so that I can walk with anointing that I don't have just an enticing words of man's wisdom but I have a demonstration of the power of the Holy Ghost listen God's got to have somebody to stand up I've had ministers call me again I'm not bragging but I've had ministers call me and say I've got somebody I need to bring to you to pray for I can't do nothing with them come on folks we, we got to somewhere along the line. We got to say, you know what? We can't keep going the way we're going. Something's got to change. We can't. We can't settle for sinners being comfortable in our services. Somewhere conviction has got to come, and they realize I can't keep living this way. My life's got to change. Somewhere along the line, somebody's got to get sick and tired of being sick and tired. Watching those that are broke down and miserable in their lives. They can't find hope because nobody can show them Jesus. Somebody's got to have the call to say, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I unto thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk and have the power to back it up. Somewhere along the way, we've got to have a determination that we've got to buck the trends and go after what God has called us to go after and be what God's called us to be. So tonight I want to leave you with a farewell appeal that Paul said to Timothy, 1 Timothy 5.22, that last part where he said, keep yourself pure. Keep yourself pure. Do not lay hands on anyone hastily. Don't lay hands on Sunday. Don't share in other people's sins. But keep yourself pure. I'm finding myself more and more disgusted with things I see and things I hear. I'm finding myself, listen, I'm finding, I'm finding now that I'm almost getting sick to my stomach with things I'm beginning to see and witness. I'm not talking about just in the church. I'm talking about in the presentation of what the world's trying to shove down our throats. I'm becoming sick to my stomach. I was listening to something on the radio the other day. I was riding down the road. And it was a news broadcast, and a commercial came on for the news broadcast, and literally I had, to, I had to hurry and get it changed. I literally became physically sick. It bothered me so bad. I mean, people are trying to shove their worldly agenda down our throats. Above all things, keep yourself pure. Did I put Ecclesiastes 9 and 8 up there? Yes. He said, let your garments always be white and let your head like no oil. What was he saying here? He said, we shouldn't be in a place that we find ourselves stained, that we find ourselves blemished, that we find ourselves in a place that we're, we're in disregard by God, that we, we, we're following our place of disrepute. we got, we got to make sure that we keep ourselves pure and let your head like no oil. We all know that oil is representative of the Spirit. Don't you ever come tr put yourself in a position that the Holy Spirit will draw Himself from you and say, I can't walk down this road with you. you got to keep yourself pure. It's a walk, folks. It's a walk. It's an endurance. It's a struggle. It's a fight. But it's worth it. You endure to the end, you'll be saved. Come on. You fight the fight. You keep the faith. There's laid up for you a crown of righteousness, which the righteous judge himself shall give unto you. you got to fight this fight. <laughs> Jude put it this way. We should contend earnestly for the faith. It's a fight, folks. I promise you, the devil ain't taking it easy on you. 
The devil ain't taking it easy on your family. He's doing everything he can, tooth and nail, to tear you down and to destroy you. And we sit back passively like, well, if I just sit right here and, and, and listen, we even uh, attribute it with Scripture. If I just be still and know that he's God and I just sit here and don't do anything, God's going to come to my rescue. I know he'll come to my rescue, but I got to shod myself with the, with, with the weapons of warfare. I got to understand my weapons of warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. I know that I got to put on the whole armor of God. I know that I got to stay away from the filthiness of the flesh. I know that I got to abstain from the things that are evil. I know that I got to keep myself pure before God. I know that I got to cleanse myself from the filthiness of the flesh. I know that there's a responsibility on my part. I know that I should not give place to the devil. I know I can't be passive about it. I promise you, if somebody come in this room tonight with a gun, they pointed it at my daughter, they'd have to kill me first. I wouldn't sit back and say, please, Mr. Gunman, please don't shoot my daughter. Please don't mess with her. She's just my gift from God. I love her so much. Please don't mess with her. Please, and, and backing away. No, 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 no. He'd have a fight on his hands. He'd probably have to unload that clip on me to stop me if he was going after my wife or my kids. I promise you. God help him if Joe don't get him at the back door. Are you with me? How is it that we're so passive in our approach to the things of God? Why is it that we, we just willy-nilly approach the things of God? We can't do that, folks. Are you... Are you as frustrated as I've been for months, years? I'm just saying we did it to do it. People are still lost. People are still sick. People are still bound. And somewhere along the line, we've, we've settled to say, well, I guess that's just, just the will of God. No, folks. That's, that's not the will of God. God's not willing that any should perish. Come on now. He's not willing to end us or perish. He is the Lord our God that heals all our diseases. Somewhere along the line, we settle. We don't even try. Let my garments be white. Let my head like no oil. Father, in the name of Jesus. I had a totally different way I was going tonight, God, and at the last moment, you changed my heart to go this direction. This is a message I've had for a long time, and I've had it set aside. Tonight, God, I believe that there's a clarion call to the people of God to, to get serious about being the church, to get serious about living our lives pure, not to participate in other people's sins, keep ourselves pure because God if we're going to see you the mandate is true we must be pure in heart if we're going to see you we must follow peace with all men and holiness without which will nobody else see you Father I'm asking today that this beat in my heart God what I feel you impressing on me God, that you'd impress it on the people of God that are here tonight. They say, you know what? I'm tired of settling. I'm tired of yielding my way, my, my, my way and what you've told me, God, in your word. I'm tired of yielding it to the, to the, to the pressures of the world and society. I'm tired of yielding to, to the things that, that you declare would be truth in my life. God, I'm tired of yielding to, 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 to living my life in just a monotonous way. But God, I've been called to live with power tired of speech. I'm tired of words. I'm ready for demonstration. I don't want to just talk about what you used to do. I want to see a demonstration of what you're able to do today. I want Stephanie. I want Peggy. I want some of these others, God, that it's been a long time or never that they've seen somebody divinely healed. God, I want to walk with power that we can see the devils cast out of people. That devils don't be comfortable in our services. Sinners get convicted and want to yield their life to you, Jesus. Get sick and repulsed by their sin and say, you know what, I can't continue to live this way. 
God, that marriages can be whole and homes can be whole and husbands will be husbands again and wives, wives and children can be in a position or place and husbands will be priests of their homes. God, put us back in line in order with your purpose and your kingdom. Help us to look unto you, Jesus, the author, the finisher of our faith. God, that we can run this race with patience that's set before us. Father, I bless your holy name. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. Can you look at me just one moment? I, the other message that I was going to minister, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to preach it, I'm just going to tell you the concept of it. God was getting ready to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. He sent angels in to warn Lot and his family to tell them that this destruction was coming. Lot went about the town trying to convince his daughters and his son-in-laws that destruction was coming. The angels came to him and said, listen, the deadline's here. We're getting ready to, ready to rain down fire and brimstone. This thing's getting ready to happen. And in Genesis chapter 19, the Bible says this, talking about Lot. And while he lingered, the angel caught him by the arm to get him out of the town. I want to tell you something, church. We can be passive about the coming of the Lord. We can be passive about the things of God. But I promise you, the trumpet of God's going to sound. God's going to call His true church home. And those that linger, those that get passive about the... Listen, the Bible said that He is coming for those that are looking and expecting Him. That's who He's coming for. We ain't got time to linger around. In this sin cursed world, we ain't got time to be passive in this sin cursed world. We ain't got time to play patty cake with people that are sinners. Listen, there, Jesus has given us a mandate. You go preaching the gospel. If they receive it, then you, you put their peace under you. If, if they don't receive it, you shake the dust off and move on. That's harsh. That's mean. How in the world could you forsake people? You're not forsaking them, they've forsaken themselves. We ain't got time to be playing games. We ain't got time to try to get an argument to convince somebody that the Bible's right. Paul told Timothy, don't you get caught up in these arguments of genealogies and fables and traditions of men. Don't you get caught up in that stuff. They're useless. If I can stand on one thing, one principle that Billy Graham stood on, he said, I come to preach Christ and preach Him crucified. And it'll change the world, folks. That gospel message will change a world. But we got to live pure. We can't linger in the things of the world. I believe the Holy Ghost is catching some people by the arm and saying, you've you've wandered and and you've you've gotten stagnant and you've gotten stale. And and I'm catching you by the arm and saying, listen, we got to go. Things are about to happen. Things are about to happen at a rapid pace. Things are about to turn around. You you, you can't sit here and, and be uh, complacent in your life anymore. You can't be complacent in your walk. It's time for you to get shaken and say, wait a minute, God. There's greater that I got to do. There's more I got to accomplish. And God is saying, I'm tired of you sitting back at ease and Zion. It's time to come awake. It's time to come alive and be the people of God I called you to be. Separated, consecrated, without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish. That's the kind of people God's looking for. That's the kind of people that God's coming back for. That's the kind of people God wants to empower. This is the pursuit that we're in to have His presence. But His presence demands purity. His presence demands holiness to live our lives separated. Everybody that will, no matter where your walk is with God, you can be a an old-timer that's been around and worship and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost and dance on the top of the pews. Or you might be here tonight and you're full of sin and you know you need to make your heart right with God. Everybody that's in this room tonight, I want you to find either a place in this altar at your seat, a place of prayer, and say, God, start in me. Create in me a clean heart, God. Renew a right spirit in me, God. Purify my heart, God, that I can have an establishment of your presence in my life. God, that my garments will be white, and my head will lack no oil. Ain't that where you want to be? That's the place we need to be. God, let my garments be white and my head like no oil. 
Would you find a place of prayer in these altars? Would you find a place of prayer tonight and ask God to speak to you and minister to you as Christian? Play softly.
don't convince yourself that a moment of prayer like this is enough. It took 10 days saturated in prayer for them to have an outpouring of the Holy Ghost at Pentecost in that upper room. It's a daily walk, folks. Paul saw the principle that he died daily and crucified his flesh every day. It's a principle that you got to live by. Start your day with, say, God, I don't want to live my day for me. I want to live my day for you. I want to live in a way that brings glory and honor to you. To live that life separated. To know that God is calling you to a, a higher calling, a worthy vocation. To be salt. To be light. If the salt's lost its flavor, it's good for nothing to be cast out, trodden under the foot of men. I don't want to be useless salt. I don't want to be a dim bulb. I don't want to be, I want to be a bright light for God's kingdom. I want to let the light of God shine through me that men may see the good works and glorify my Father which is in heaven. Amen. But it's a daily dying to self. And I'll tell you this, if it goes unchecked, it'll get out of hand. Before you know it, you'll be asking the question, how did I ever get here? It's something you got to keep in check. I told, I told a young man about a week ago, he and I were talking, and he was talking about some struggles he was having and things going on. I told him, I said, you know, I get saved every day. I said, about the best way I can explain it to you. I just go back to God and ask him to search me, ask him to save me and set me free from my sins. And I'm not ashamed to stand here and tell you that. Because I know that this old boy gets in trouble sometimes. This old boy thinks things, acts things, says things, regrets a lot of things. I have to go before God and say, God, it's me again. I did it again. Here am I. Cleanse me. He tells us that he doesn't want us to sin. And I listen. I don't start my day thinking, how can I get God upset with me today? I don't, I don't start my day that way. I'm thinking, Lord, I want to please you today. But something about people, stuff, just kind of messes with you sometimes, you know? At the end of the day, you feel horrible. During the day, you feel horrible sometimes because you, you did, said, thought, whatever it was. You just go back to God and say, man, God, I, I know I broke your heart. I know I've let you down. I'm so sorry. He's faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse. I love him so much. So thankful. God's always there for us. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. Amen. Amen. I don't want to take advantage of his grace. Paul said in Romans, what should, what should we continue in sin that God's grace may abound? God forbid. Listen, it's not about a continuance. When I repented of something, I move on from it. But I promise you, there's things that God checks my heart and says, son, if you want to keep coming closer, these are things you've got to work on. These are things you got to get away from. These are things you got to leave alone. And whatever I got to do to draw closer to Him, to have more of His presence and His power, I promise you, whatever I feel like I'm sacrificing in this world is far greater than what God, far greater than what God's got for me, than anything I could ever give up for His glory. Amen. I encourage you to not let this be a moment. To not let this be a a time where you just felt pricked in your heart and you decided, oh, I'm going to say a little prayer and I'm going to move on. But pure purity and holiness, it's a lifestyle. It's a decision. It's a determination. It's a fight against the flesh. It's a war. Paul said there's a war going on in my members. It's a war. But the victory is paid for when we abide in Christ. Amen. Allow him to give us the victory. Greater is he to send you than he's in the world. He's a good God. Amen. I love you guys so much. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Go ahead, brother Jim.